Dermatophilus congoensis causes superficial infections in many species. And as sort of a general uh, model for this disease, uh, we see infections when we have a carrier animal present, oftentimes a subclinical carrier. You may not know that they are uh, colonized with this organism. When we have an abundance of moisture, so there is a seasonality to Dermatophilus congoensis infections, and you need to be aware of your local climate and when the animals are going to be exposed to these wet conditions. So perhaps in places that are warmer and wetter than here in Saskatchewan, Dermatophilus infections will be more common. And then finally, when you have some damage to the skin, so some sort of trauma of the tissue that allows these organisms to invade. So Dermatophilus lives on the skin, Moisture stimulates release of zoospores, which can then be mechanically transmitted uh, between animals. In dermatophilosis, we see crusting lesions of uh, the cutaneous tissues, and colloquial names vary with the animal species and also the site of infection. So in horses, rain scald is what we call the infections which occur on the back whereas dew poisoning are for those infections on the lower extremities, so horses kept in wet pastures. In sheep, lumpy wool or mycotic dermatitis is when it's on the skin. Um, it's not mycotic. This is not actually a fungal infection, um, so this is just the colloquial name. And then strawberry foot rot on the distal extremities. Um, again, colloquial names can be quite problematic, and so make sure not to confuse strawberry foot rot with strawberry heel warts in cattle that are caused by Treponema species, a very, very different bacteria that we'll talk about later in this class. Treatment of dermatophilus infections in our large animals relies on topical disinfectants and antimicrobials, depending on which species we're dealing with. Obviously, removing them from the wet environment um, and discarding all of the crusts or other uh, affected tissues that are removed from the animal. So these can serve as a source of infection for naive animals, and you want to get those out of the environment, throw them away. And of course, when you're doing this management, make sure to wear gloves. You don't want to get a dermatophilus infection yourself. Here we can see some pathological lesions associated with dermatophilus congoensis. Um, unfortunately, I was unable to find any Creative Commons licensed images of small ruminants. So here on the right, we have a suppurative and hyperkeratotic epidermitis um, on the ear of a white-tailed deer. In the center here, we have hyperplastic bovine skin with this very greasy and crusting uh, appearance can be seen. And then finally on the right, uh, we have dermatitis and crusting on a ground squirrel head. While these images may be of species other than small ruminants and horses, um, these would be sort of classical appearances of the lesion. In dogs and cats, we can see exudative skin disease. Um, in dogs, it's typically superficial on haired skin. And in cats, it's oftentimes associated with abscesses. Treatment of these infections is to keep the skin clean and dry, um, bathing and crust removal, as well as systemic antimicrobials, typically the penicillins. Here you can see a uh, dog with a dermatophilus infection, and I think you can appreciate that there's erythema, so reddening, and then crusty scab formation as well. This is a screenshot of the title of a paper from the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery um, that describes dermatophilus congolensis in cats, what it looks like clinically, and how you deal with it. And for anyone who's interested, I would encourage you to take a look at this paper. Truparella pyogenes is associated with a wide variety of separative infections. Um, there is no real classical presentation. It's opportunistic, so it will gladly cause infections wherever it's given the opportunity, um, whether that's laryngeal abscesses in calves, liver abscesses in cattle, um, acting as a component of bovine respiratory disease, or causing arthritis, osteomyelitis, and subcutaneous abscesses in pigs. Truparella pyogenes is oftentimes a component of polymicrobial infections, and it's famous for hanging out with its good friend Fusobacterium necrophorum, a non-spore-forming anaerobe that we'll talk about in a couple of lectures. Another common theme with Truparella pyogenes is it likes to spread by septic emboli. And so one of the classical examples of this are liver abscesses in cattle. Cattle who 
uh, have grain overload. They get this highly fermentable diet. We see a ruminitis resulting from lactic acidosis, translocation of rumen microbes into the portal venous system. Um, you can get abscessation of the caudal vena cava, and then septic emboli spreading through the venous system to the right side of the heart and lungs. Um, bacteria then get stuck in capillary beds and set up infections um, at secondary sites. So where, where the vasculature starts to narrow, the organisms get stuck and you get metastatic abscessations all over the body. So this is part of that same process that we talked about in our streptococcus lecture um, with strep bovis playing that important role in lactic acidosis. Here you can see some images of bovine liver abscesses. Um, these are very, very common, and I think you can see this sort of thick, creamy, purulent material um, within the bovine liver. On these cytology images, you can see Truparella pyogenes from cattle specimens, um, these pleomorphic gram-positive rods. Um, the image on the right is actually bovine milk from a case of mastitis, so able to cause infections in a wide variety of anatomical locations. So I hope I've convinced you that the actinomycetales are a really fascinating group of bugs. Um, they produce antibiotics, they cause infections, they're normal microbiota, they're found in the environment, um, and we can find them in some even more unusual and delicious places. So Arthrobacter species was grown from air samples on the Mir space station, and Brevibacterium, which is another genus within the actinomyce actinomycetales, um, they have a, a cheese odor, and they're actually part of the microbial community um, in Limburg cheese and other soft ripened cheeses. So they're in space, they're in foods we eat, and they cause infections in a wide variety of interesting and um, wonderful ways. Specimens to collect, really it depends what you're dealing with, um, exudates, aspirates, fluid aspirated by thoracocentesis, so, so think pyothorax and companion animals, crusts, mastitic milk. Um, histopathology can be very useful, so getting biopsies of granulomas. Sample handling, it's really going to depend on what you're doing. Um, of course, for propagative methods, we don't want to be freezing our samples. If you're going to be requesting histology, fixing those samples in 10% formalin is, is certainly possible. Smears of aspirates are very, very useful in coming up with a presumptive diagnosis. So seeing those filamentous gram-positive rods, um, potentially acid fast structures can be very, very useful for nocardia. Identification of granules and pus, or those tram track lesions, um, are also nearly pathognomonic. So I would encourage you to have a look for yourself. Um, these, these are things which you may be able to come to a presumptive diagnosis yourself before receiving laboratory guidance. For nocardia species specifically, it's important to know that these can actually be missed on hematoxylin and eosin stained slides. They don't stain very well, um, and so false negatives are, are certainly a concern. I've talked a fair bit about this tram track morphology of Dermatophilus congolensis, and so I thought I needed to show you a picture. So here we have a cytology preparation from an affected animal, and I think you can see these very characteristic uh, sort of double rows of zoospores um, in, in both of these images. There's really nothing else that looks like this, so this gives you a very good idea of, of what's going on in, in a patient. Here you can see a cytology image of mastitic milk from a cow. And note the filamentous acid fast or pink rods, which are consistent with nocardia species. Culture, this is certainly possible with any of these organisms. Actinomyces will grow well on blood agar. They are, however, carboxyphilic, so they will do better. They'll grow faster um, in an environment enriched with 5 to 10% CO2. Identification of them to the species level can be challenging. Um, with either Malditoff or biochemical ID. Um, so if you really need a species level ID, the lab may need to do some uh, molecular work, sequencing a, a universal bacterial target like potentially 16S or CPN60 would be really useful.
Microbiologists do get very excited about taxonomy. Um, and so keep in mind that names are likely to change as you move through vet school and move out into practice. As we've talked about before, advances in microbiology allow things which were previously lumped together to be split into unique species. As far as zoonotic or interspecies transmission goes, um, actinomyces is part of the normal oral microbiota. We have it in our own mouths as well. And when people get infections with these bugs, it's typically not uh, transmitted from animals, so a low zoonotic risk. Truparella pyogenes is also not a major zoonotic risk. Dermatophilus congolensis, on the other hand, um, skin infections in people certainly are possible um, when you have contact with infected animals and you have some sort of skin trauma, so a small cut, possibly even insect bites. And so when working with these uh, cases of dermatitis, I would strongly encourage you to wear gloves to protect yourself. Treatment options, it really depends on which bugs we're talking about. For actinomyces species, uh, penicillin is the treatment of choice. For nocardia, we generally rely on the sulfonamides. Truparella pyogenes is readily treated with either the penicillins or tetracyclines. Um, unfortunately, for all of these organisms, we have relatively little data available on their antimicrobial susceptibility. And so oftentimes we're left to treat empirically without laboratory guidance. There are some high level recommendations that we can make. So most actinomyces species are metronidazole resistant. This should be some intrinsic resistance. And then this is a table which I've reproduced from a human clinical microbiology textbook showing which uh, drugs various nocardia species are likely to be susceptible to and likely to be resistant to. This is obviously not a hard and fast rule, but these may be good first treatments to consider. Of course, a couple of new uh, terms for today and some questions for self-assessments. Mm -hmm.